Sure. What's the topic? We, we're we're going to move on um, to the next piece is really about um, if, if, if it's not about the update, the legislation, and it's really the next topic is going to be and what are, what are the outstanding issues? I know you're uh, you're at the forefront of outstanding issues as we talk about um, those things that have had a negative impact as, yeah. as from the implementation of the plan and participation in the plan as it refers to rights. So is, yeah. is that what you'd like to do? Okay. Yes, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yep. So um, for those of you, I'm Representative Rod Hamilton. I represent District 22B, the southwestern part of the state. Um, I have uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, a couple years ago, I actually enrolled into the program. Um, I doctor my specialist is with the Mayo Clinic. And so they actually wrote the prescription. Um, I toured all the facilities. I was very impressed with the professionalism, the safety, the security um, with both facilities. And uh, right after the department helped me enroll into the program, I was notified um, the ATF sent out a blank statement back in 2000, or excuse me, a, a statement back in 2011, I believe it was, that this is a controlled substance and anybody who enrolls in uh, the medical cannabis program would therefore lose their second amendment rights. Um, I could no longer purchase ammunition, have gun, gun ownership, I could not renew. I had a permit to carry. I could not renew my permit to carry because I was straight up, open and honest with everybody. I never uh, even filled my prescription. Um, I have. Uh, I'm no longer enrolled into the program uh, because I want to chase change the law. And uh, before I move forward once again, and so um, you think about it, this is still a Schedule One narcotic in the eyes of the federal government. We are all criminals in the eyes of the federal government, and this is wrong. I've heard the stories from people who are receiving very uh, a great benefits um, from using this product uh, for medicinal, you know, well-being, if you will. And uh, it's very unfortunate that we are once again um, we're all criminals. I know for a fact there are people driving across state lines purchasing this uh, because people have approached me uh, because it is cheaper, um, and uh, so that's taking place. They are criminals, and so. My question would be to everybody, what are we doing or what could we do to put pressure on the federal government uh, to, to change this, to at least get it changed from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 2 or something like that? I'd like to hear from people who are working uh, in other states as well. What can we do? Because like I said, I lost my Second Amendment rights. I'm not in the program. I never filled, filled my prescription. Uh, I would really like to see if this could help my condition. I suffer from muscle spasms and spasticity and, uh, and pain as well. Um, but again, um, well, I'm going to stop there, Mr. Chairman. What can we do to help change this so that we are not all criminals? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hamilton. And, and I think that's, that's the very uh, component of the latter half of this uh, conversation is about what are those known issues where we put people into, into a conflict with uh, current law enforcement, um, yours specifically with a right? And, and as well as when we look at, I think the whole, you know, over the summer, it's been about a conversation of possession. You know, what, what, what does that look like relative to a very dangerous pharmaceutical uh, and widely accepted uh, and intoxicating um, uh, painkiller, whatever that would be? Those are fine. And so this is a very purpose of the conversation to look at and see how do we make sure that we don't put more people in compliance and routine using a prescription uh, legal drug in Minnesota um, just happens to be cannabis based. And so we would seek um, open input. I know uh, Representative uh, Gomez, Representative Munson and yourself, but there's a whole bunch of people that have a list. This is the part, this is why we're going to have the conversation. Uh, um, I would like input um from anybody that has a more national because everybody in the everybody in the in the is in the same boat from a, a, a federal government is still scheduling as a as a as a class one narcotic um so seek open input from anybody um i think we see representative king or i'm sorry i don't mean to to demote you there mr kingsley but uh <laughs> Rep, mr kingsley if you would like to add some comment and we'll seek any comment from any additional um, people have experience in the other states as they've addressed these issues and have they been able to do it successfully? 
Yeah, um, Mr. Senator, so I, I've been fortunate enough uh, over the last year plus to sit on the United States Cannabis Council, which is a group of, uh, I think it's approaching 100 different companies now that are lobbying on the federal side for meaningful change. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Hamilton, the, the, the kind of the issues that you, that you state really do require federal change. And as many of you may know, there's currently sort of a log jam of various competing proposals on the federal level. Um, there's a, a sort of, um, there's some comprehensive legislation. There's some more focused stuff that may or may not get through this year. And there's also some competing uh, Republican legislation uh, that could pass as early as next year, potentially, if we get a, if we get a change uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives and Senate. So um, my best guess is that we do not see federal change, which is a major impediment to the issues you've described. Uh, this year, and it, it could be uh, you know two to three years out before we see that. Um, others are more optimistic, and I'd be curious if if Gina has any uh, um, national uh, insights. Sure, I mean I, th I think I'm in line with you that uh, no federal change is expected this year, t two to five years from now, <laughs> um, depending on you know how things evolve evolve in Washington D.C. But um, you know for the time being, I think it's status quo. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. So no other no other states have made a significant progress in either directing. Um, Representative Gomez, of course, we have a bill. She's had that in the comments and or is that something ha have other states directed their commissioner of Department of Health to request those exemptions? Um, has, has any of that occurred? Is anybody aware? I want to say Iowa might be in the process of making that exemption petition. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but maybe um, one of the legislators that has that bill that might be able to explain it a little bit better than me could explain the petition for exemption piece that we're kind of interweaving with changing federal law. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. And uh, we'll, we'll take Mr. Teske. He's got his hand up if you'd like to comment on that um, before we go to other members. Mr. Teske? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Um, I was just going to clarify that in Iowa, it was a um, third party, non-legislatively directed petition to the DEA for the exemption, but Hawaii did have a legislative directive to their medical cannabis office to petition the DEA. Uh, as far as I know, the Iowa petition was um, rejected, and Hawaii's petition is currently in process. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Jaskowski. That's helpful. So um, it certainly is on top of the list. Um, in addition to, when I look at the topics that have come across, and Representative Hamilton, of course, the Second Amendment is one of them. The other one is possession. You know, the the how we treat um, a medicinal cannabis relative to any other dangerous pharmaceutical drug that you also shouldn't be driving with and or, you know, but you can legally possess in your pocket, in your car and everywhere. Um, uh, driving under the influence, it kind of goes all together and in, in, in what we can do. The other one that I had, um, and this isn't tied to the, um, the original enabling legislation as an outstanding issue is, is Delta-8. Um, essentially, what's happened is certainly Delta 8 has uh, provided for recreational, recreational cannabis, um, what I believe appears to be illegally because it's a synthetic THC currently be, being sold in every store um, across the state of Minnesota today. So I'd be curious if anybody has any experience or, or has been tracking that as well. Um, so those are the only things that I had at the high level. I know there's a whole host of issues. Um, that we have. So let's start with, um, we've got two hands up um, and then we'll continue to go down the list of issues. And this will be the uh, a set of, of issues that I know many have uh, drafted some legislation, but to have the conversation to get them, I get all those identified. And then I think our it'll fall into our meeting frequency or the need to meet um, more frequently than it has than we have to make sure to see what we can get through this legislative session what can we tackle and get taken care of so we, we minimize the negative impacts of participating in a complete legal program in Minnesota? Um, Ms. Schroeder? Yes, you, you speak to me, Senator. Um, so I actually have kind of spent the last week delving into the hemp Delta 8, I learned last night, Delta 9 
um, hemp issue in advance of this meeting because I expected it would come up. And those of you that know me know that I like to know what I'm talking about. Um, the sale of Delta 8 concerns me. The sale of, I actually bought um, last night, uh, I went to a smoke shop. And I was asking them, you know, hey, have you seen any MDA or Board of Pharmacy enforcement here? Um, because the Department of Ag and the Board of Pharmacy have begun enforcing slash um, threatening to enforce that there are no regulations, food and beverage with CBD is not authorized, et cetera. And um, as I was talking, you know, the person learned I was knowledgeable in a patient and they said, well, we have these Delta 9 gummies that are hemp derived because the CBD was converted to Delta 9. Fortunately, I don't have the packet in front of me, super illegal to possess. So I would appreciate if the officers didn't call the local sheriff um, because it was, I, I wanted to see what these were. I wanted to see what the label said, wanted to have a pack, I wanted to have the packaging um, as an exhibit, I guess, of what is out there being sold over the counter. This is incredibly concerning, right? Because not everyone is a good actor. Not everyone is checking IDs. Um, and these items are ending up in the hands of, these items are, first of all, can be unsafe because not all of them are tested. They're not regulated. Second, we don't know who's getting their hands on them. And I think that we have a fundamental conflict here because we do have a Minnesota homegrown hemp industry. And that, <laughs> does fall under the purview of this task force after some 2019 or 2020 legislation that allowed these two manufacturers to sell hemp and hemp products, um, which I have another question on that. But um, my point is, I guess, as a task force with a duty to provide a report to the legislature that we have not produced since 2017 that is supposed to include hemp products, we should probably have a very serious conversation about this. I think we should probably have a special meeting on this issue because we have to reconcile the fact that we do have a homegrown cannabis industry within 18K, which is the hemp program, with a limitation of two medical cannabis manufacturers but we have all of these companies that are about to go out of business because they're being enforced against for producing products that are also produced by the medical manufacturers. I think it's a fundamental problem. There are patients that are purchasing hemp products. I purchase hemp products um, from a Minnesota grown, Minnesota local company that is producing under 18K and it terrifies me that those products could be pulled from the shelf. And so I, I really urge our, our task force leadership, especially Senator Cran, Representative Edelson, to get us together to work on this issue from the perspective of patients. Um, Thanks, and then, you know, oh, go ahead. Um, I did have another question along those lines with the hemp products. Um, I know that the, so we added edibles, I wrote that petition, um, and we added gummies and chews, which are authorized for sale as of August 1st. But I did notice that the two manufacturers are selling CBD chewables now, gummies. Um, and I'm just wondering how that's authorized. I reviewed uh, 152 9 and my interpretation and my recollection of that legislation being passed was that when hemp products entered a patient center, they would be held to the same standard as medical cannabis. And I'm, I'm curious, A, if it is, and B, what the rationale is for allowing them to sell hemp products that are not yet allowed by the medical program within a patient, within the patient well, center. Well, Ms. Schroeder, you did a great job at identifying an entire meeting's agenda. <laughs> so, um, but uh, on the Delta 8 and 9, I'm looking at it as, is this just another version of bath salt, you know, for THC in that they're getting around untested, you know, it's, it's an untested um, component and illegal, I believe, by state law as it stands today being um, offered on the shelves today. So um, we do need to address that and make sure. Um, as far as the edibles, is Ms. Stokes or who could address that from, uh, for Mayor, uh, represent, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Schroeder's uh, second question. Is it Ms. Stokes or who could address that question? 
Sure. Um, I think that Darren could tackle the um, the question about the um, CBD. The, the gummies that are being sold by our manufacturers are not part of the medical cannabis program. They are um, over-the-counter um, products that are not produced by the medical cannabis manufacturers. So I can I can let Darren address that. Okay, Mr. Teske, is there any, would you like to add any additional comment to that? Ms. Roder's question? Um, I'm sorry, I was taking notes. What was the second part of the question? Ms. Schroeder, could you repeat your question quickly? Yeah, it was the question about um, what is authorizing the two medical manufacturers to sell edibles um, from the as a hemp product out of the patient center when 152.29 reads as if any hemp products sold by the manu by the medical manufacturers within their patient centers authorized by the medical program are I'll quote from the statute subject to the same quality control program security and testing requirements and other requirements that apply to medical cannabis. Sure. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Um, and Ms. Schroeder, uh, the unregulated CBD products that manufacturers have are not medical cannabis. Um, what we regulate is the medical cannabis products. Uh, what 152.29 allows is for our manufacturers to acquire hemp and convert it into a medical cannabis product. Uh, the, the products you're talking about are not of that class. They are, um, as I understand it, um, simply retail CBD, similar to what you would find uh, in other stores and uh, other locations. Thank you. So they, they're, they're outside our, our scope. Thank you, Mr. Chesky. Ms. Schroeder, follow up? Um, yeah, I just, I, I really take that. I understand the department's position on that. I just, patients are the ones going to the patient centers to purchase from a medical cannabis manufacturer. Our statute 152.29 is very clear. Hemp and hemp products acquired by a manufacturer are subject to the same quality control program, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're also supposed to be tested by a contracted lab approved by the commissioner. And they're supposed to verify that the hemp grower hemp processor has a valid license issued by our commissioner of ag under chapter 18 K. My concern is that if we're, if we're interpreting the CBD products that are being sold as being 18 K products under MDA, I think 152 to nine, the intent is that it would be treated as medical cannabis if it is being sold to patients out of a patient center. That that's the point I'm making. I don't I don't care what hemp subsidiaries of these two companies are selling at the gas station because you can buy the same product at the gas station that you can buy in the patient center from the CBD market. I'm concerned with what patients are receiving from a medical cannabis manufacturer in a patient center when I believe the intent, at least the intent of when I supported this legislation was that it would be in the realm of, it would be treated as medical cannabis and it's not being treated as medical cannabis. And I think that that's problematic. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ms. Schroeder. And uh, we'll, we have, uh, I think all of these are issues are gonna be, continue to be intertwined as we move forward and, and to get the program defined and working to its uh, most efficient manner. Um, Ms. Rollman, you had your next in your question or your hand up. Oh, um, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, Delta 8 is, is an issue that we're confronting in, you know, every market. Um, so we have done some work on it, working with legislators in other states. So, you know, at the right time, at the right meeting, happy to, you know, try to participate and, and help where possible in, in, in dealing with that issue. Excellent. Thanks, Ms. Rollman. Um, question for anybody here, the, the cannabis experts, and it relates to synthetic THC, which it sounds is what Delta 8 is. Um, does it have the same residual or characteristics of standard THC in its uh, 
the ability for it to remain in uh, a component in the bloodstream or in somebody for up to 30 days or longer, or does it have a shorter lifespan in the ability, or is it even is it detectable as as cannabis derived, derived THC? Can somebody help me out with that? And who would that be? This is Dina Rollman. I, I would Ms. Rollman? think that yeah, pr probably Rachel could speak better this to, better to this than I can because I'm not a, a science a, you know a scientist by background, but. I will just say, you know, really briefly, it's it's not that Delta Eight is um, synthetic. Um, it is actually different than bath salts or things like that that were synthetic. It's a naturally occurring component of the cannabis plant, um, but it does. It, what people call it is really cannabis light because it it generally doesn't produce THC levels quite as high and intoxicating as as Delta Nine, um, but it sure is intoxicating enough that it should be regulated. So. You know, again, we can get into it at, at the more appropriate time, but it's it's still part of the same plant, um, but it's just kind of almost like a loophole that's being exploited um, so that people don't have to be regulated in order to produce it and sell it. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Roman. And um, we've got a couple of people up there, but I see uh, Ms. Folks hop on. Um, Ms. Folks? Sure. I just wanted to add to to what Dina said. So the Delta-8 is naturally occurring in, in the plant, but in very small quantities. And so what we are seeing on the market is a chemical conversion. So people, there are manufacturers who are chemically converting CBD into Delta-8. So I, I would argue that it's it's a, a mix and part of the, uh, the issue is that it's a big unknown. I would also just caution us to not get too focused on Delta-8, that there are hundreds of cannabinoids in the plant. And so I think that we need to, um, to think a little bit more broadly, um, because if you're too restrictive, you'll just start seeing Delta 10 and other other things pop up. So, thank you, Ms. Folks. Um, I had uh, Anne. Your last name, Hoekstra. Hoekstra. And um, I had a question for Dr. Kingsley, or maybe the Leafline Lab folks. Um, I was wondering, do you guys have any problems hiring pharmacists because of? The concern with the uncertainty with the conflict between state and federal mandates and so you know you need to have your medical cannabis distributed by a pharmacist but i know there's a lot of hesitancy with that um, conflict so i'm just wondering if there's any hiring problems um, just getting healthcare providers to sign on with your company to distribute that miss roman or uh, mr uh, or um, uh, mr kingsley would you like to address uh no issue on the the vireo side with hiring pharmacists um i'm not aware yeah i'm not aware of a, an issue um buck please you know correct me if i'm wrong nope we've had no issue at all mr chair all right thank you mr mcalpine thank Ms. you Hoekstra, any follow-up um i guess i just had one more question about um epilodex so that's a cannabidiol derived product that's fda approved um I know that, you know, if the FDA is willing to kind of look at products like this, has there been any um, legislation, anything that you're aware of where they're actually trying to run it through the FDA to actually get it approved? Um, I don't know if your companies pursue that avenue. I know it is a scheduled one medication, but um, if it goes through like FDA approval, FDA evaluation, is that something that you guys have ever pursued, looked at? Um, Mr. Kingsley or Ms. Roman? Yeah, I can address that briefly. So uh, as you guys know, the FDA path is, is generally cost prohibitive uh, with a cost between somewhere you know, between 100 million and, and multiple billions of dollars to get a single approved molecule, molecule through the standard FDA route. Our approach to date has been to, to be involved in, in clinical trials and gather significant safety and efficacy data around our standardized products. Um, at, you know, at this time, we do have multiple um, ongoing clinical trials uh, in New York and, and other locations. So, you know, short term, it's not going to re give relief to our patients, but, but long term, it's an interesting path to get widespread adoption of cannabis derived uh, pharmaceutical products. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you, it. Ms. Rollman, anything to add? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ho Ms. Hoekstra. Um, we have uh, Rachel next. Yes, I just wanted to chime in also um, on the um, derivatives that are the synthetic derivatives that are created from CBD isolate converting to Delta A, Delta 10, uh, etc. Um, from a chemist perspective, the um, 
the conditions that are needed to do those types of reactions require some pretty um, nasty type of solvents in catalysts. So the idea that there are folks that are producing these compounds probably in their garage, um, they're not regulated, uh, they're, they're not being tested for residual solvents, residual metals, uh, that's a huge concern, you know, when it comes to safety. Um, so just wanted to add that. I appreciate it, Ms. Wildner. And we have Aaron. I, I don't have a last name for you there, Aaron. Aaron Chase. Chase. 